Take your copy of the Word of God and open it to Luke 22. Luke 22 is where we're going to be today. I'll read to you from verse 19 here in just a few minutes. Here on this Palm Sunday, I want to preach to you a message entitled, The Bread of Life, Jesus Christ in the Matzah. The Bread of Life, Jesus Christ in the Matzah. As we've already reflected on today, we call this Palm Sunday. We are looking back and we are reflecting on the wonderful and the tragic events that transpired during the last week of the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I thought it appropriate today that in doing so, what you and I might ought to do is to look back and to consider just one of the seven I Am statements that Jesus made in the Gospel of John. Maybe you've never thought about this before. But in John's beautiful gospel, the fourth gospel, there are seven witnesses reported, there are seven miracles recorded, and there are seven I am statements that come directly from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of those statements tells us something amazing and special about our Savior Jesus. I only want to read to you the first of those today, and I think you'll see why here in a while. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But how is it that human beings come to Jesus? Dear friend, if you're here today and you don't know the answer to that question, let me tell you, there's one way to approach the Lord and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 6, 29, this is the work of God that you, that I, believe in Him who sent Him. Faith alone in God Almighty, our Savior Jesus Christ, that is the only way of salvation. But what did Jesus really mean? when he called himself the bread of life. What sort of bread was he talking about? Well, I think for you and I to understand the answer to that question, we're going to need to fast forward to the last week of Christ's life. And let me say to you from the beginning, you and I reckon time on what's called a Gregorian calendar. Sunday through Saturday, we count days as days and nights, 24-hour period, day and night. Well, the Jewish people do it differently. They reckon time by nights and days a little bit different from us. And so I'm going to be sharing with you some things this morning that are foreign to the Gentile mind. It's hard sometimes for us to get our minds around these things because we're not Jewish, but in understanding the Jewish roots of our faith, we can come to a much greater, deeper, awesome understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to provide for us here this morning. So with that in mind, understand that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what you and I call Palm Sunday on the Jewish calendar. We believe that would have been Nisan 10 on their calendar. Nisan 10 just also happened to be the day when the high priest selected a Passover lamb that was to be slaughtered later on in the week. Keep in mind that the Jewish people celebrated the Passover every single year. And we'll talk more about the roots of that in a few minutes. Jesus rode in to Jerusalem on Nisan 10, and then he presented himself and taught the people in the temple for the next four days. Now listen to me, that's noteworthy because after the high priest selected a Passover lamb, that lamb was placed on display and then the high priest had four days to inspect the lamb to make sure there was no blemish, no handicap at all in the lamb. And so Jesus presents himself in the temple. He's seen by the people. They have an opportunity to examine him for four days. You'll recall that Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane where they prayed. And then the temple guard came and arrested him. And then he was forced to stand an illegal trial before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin condemned Jesus to death and then he shipped him, they shipped Jesus off to the Romans because they could not pronounce the death penalty themselves. That jurisdiction had to come down from the Romans and in this case from Pilate. 
Do you remember what happened when they brought Jesus to stand before Pilate? Pilate examined him. Now, Pilate's not a Christian. Pilate's not a Christian by any means. He's not even a believer in God. The only gods he would have believed in would have been pagan gods. But when he gets an opportunity to examine Jesus, he makes a statement to the crowds about Jesus. What does he say? He says, I've examined him and I find no fault in him. Why is that significant? Because on Nisan 14, the high priest after having examined the Passover lamb for four days, would come out and make a pronouncement to the nation of Israel. He would say these words, Behold the lamb, I find no fault in him. Are you seeing some parallels yet? And though Pilate found no fault in our Lord Jesus Christ in order to appease the Jews, he sentenced Christ to go and to be cruelly beaten and flogged. And then also later to suffer a death by crucifixion. The, the worst of deaths that was reserved for the worst of criminals. I mean the dregs of society. And the Bible says that Jesus carried his patibulum, his cross beam, all the way to the place that is called Calvary, Golgotha. Translated means place of the skull that you can still see in Jerusalem today. Now get this. Jesus after his kangaroo court trial at the hands of the Sanhedrin, after he's beaten, after he's condemned, when he gets to Calvary, they nail him to the cross and the Bible says it was the third hour. That means it was 9 a.m. when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. That's significant because every single day, the Jewish people, the priests, they would offer up sacrifices in the temple. Guess what time the time of the morning sacrifice was? 9 a.m. Jesus hung on the cross until 3 p.m. Take a guess at what time the evening sacrifice was offered up. 3 p.m. And it just so happened on Nisan 14 when it was the Passover, it was at that very same hour that the Passover lamb was slaughtered. And so Jesus died and was buried on Nisan 14. He also rose from the dead in the early morning hours of Nisan 17. You say, Pastor, that sounds great. We're just wowed with your knowledge, but what in the world does that mean? Well, I don't have a lot of knowledge, but I do want to be crystal clear about this. Listen to me. Jesus was in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea on the days of Nisan 14, Nisan 15, and Nisan 16, and also in the tomb on the nights of Nisan 15, 16, and 17. Now, I'm just a hillbilly, but that means to me that Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights. Is that important? I'm glad you asked. What did Jesus say in Matthew 12, verse 40? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but the only sign that will be given to it is the sign of Jonah. And what did God say about that? Our Savior Christ, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of of the earth. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ was the perfect fulfillment of prophecy. And by the way, Jesus Christ, while he was slaughtered on Passover, he resurrected at the feast of first fruits because the Bible says Jesus Christ is the first fruit of those that have died. Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection is the perfect fulfillment of prophecy beyond any shadow of doubt. You and I should be fully convinced today that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Lamb of God, and Jesus is the only hope for sinful mankind. But what about the bread? You say, preacher, you told us you were going to talk about the bread today. Well, let's talk about it then. On the night before His death, the evening of Nisan 14. Jesus took his disciples to the upper room where they celebrated together an early Passover Seder. That is a Passover meal. Typically, they would have celebrated it with everybody else in the nation on the next night, but Christ knew full well what was awaiting the next day. 
And so they celebrated the Passover early. Passover Seder was the meal that was enjoyed by a Jewish family after the slaughter of the Passover lamb. Do you know that the Jewish people still celebrate Passover? They've been celebrating now for about the past 3,500 years. Passover goes all the way back to Exodus 12. Do you remember the story? When God was about to release the Jewish people from their Egyptian captivity, He had sent nine plagues already to try and help Pharaoh understand, you better let my people go. But his heart was hardened, the Bible says, and he would not listen, he would not believe. And so God says, I'm going to send one more final, most terrible plague. The firstborn. I'm going to require the life of the firstborn. And the only way that a firstborn can be saved is if the blood of a spotless lamb is taken and applied to the door and down the side of the post. And the Bible says, not the death angel, but when the Lord himself went through the camps of Egypt and through the camps of Israel, when he went to the camps of Israel, he found the blood on the door. And when God found the blood of a spotless lamb on the door, the Bible the Bible says he would pass over that house. And that's why we call it Passover. Jesus, when he's in the upper room with the disciples, he, though he institutes the Lord's Supper, he didn't come there to celebrate the Lord's Supper. He came there to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. You see, the Passover Seder was a perpetual reminder of their long, bitter slavery in Egypt. By the way, as long as, as, as uh, our ancestors have been on this continent 400 years, that's how long, even longer than that, was the period of time that the Jewish people were in slavery in Egypt. Hundreds of years of hard labor. And then, of course, the Passover was a perpetual reminder of God's amazing deliverance of the nation from Egypt back to the promised land. Some of you maybe have seen before, I'm going to have this done once again, but my friend, a missionary with Chosen People Ministries, Boris Golden, a rabbi, Messianic rabbi, he has been here at this church before, and he has set up the Passover Seder table, and he has gone through all of the elements of the Seder, and they are many, parsley, a lamb shank bone, bitter herbs, roasted egg, all the rest of the elements. And I don't know if you remember, but when my good friend Boris set up the Passover Seder, there were four cups in the Passover observance. Cup one, cup of sanctification. Two, the cup of plagues. Three, the cup of redemption. Remember that one. And fourth, the cup of praise. The Passover, dear church, makes use of a special bread that is called matzah. Matzah bread. Matzah dates back to Israel's exodus from Egypt. It is flat as a piece of paper. You can see that, right? And the reason it's so flat is because it's unleavened. And that was to remind them that they had no time even to wait for their bread to rise when God called them to depart from the land of Egypt and to go free toward their their freedom, towards the Red Sea and then on to the promised land. There is no doubt that the bread that Jesus and his disciples ate at the Passover table was matzah bread. And my goal with this message today is to show you we are going to see that Jesus is the true matzah come down from heaven. He is the bread of life who gives life to all of those who partake of Him. I want to ask you to stand to your feet in honor of the reading of the Word of God. You've been sending down maybe a little while now. Luke 22. I'm going to begin reading at verse 19. If you found it and you're ready to go, say amen. Amen. Now say amen like you mean it. Amen. Amen. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Be seated, please. Thank you so much. Several things I want to say to you about this matzah today. 
The matzah, first of all, you noticed just a moment ago, obviously, it is unleavened. What does that mean to us? What does that mean about Jesus Christ? Well, if it's a picture of Christ, then we know that it is. That means Jesus was and is sinless. Jesus was and is sinless. Now understand this, the Jewish people were not permitted to use any kind of leaven during their Passover festivities for two main reasons. First of all, I've already told you, it was to be a reminder to them that when they left their captivity, they did not even have enough time for their bread to rise. They had to get up and hastily leave at the command of God and go to their freedom. But also I want you to understand that for the Jewish people, leaven was understood to be a symbol of sin. When a little bit of leaven gets into something, it permeates the entire loaf, right? Amen? So beware about getting a little bit of sin in your life because in just a little while, it can permeate your entire life. Didn't Jesus warn about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Don't be guilty of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Passover was a time of repentance and cleansing. It was a time when the Jews were to pray and work diligently to remove sin from their lives. This unleavened piece of matzah bread reminds us that Jesus was completely perfect. The Bible says about him in Hebrews 4.15, he was at all points tempted as we are. That means however you can be tempted, dear friend, our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted in that way somehow. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, in every single category of sin, Jesus Christ was tempted in that manner as we are tempted in all points. And yet the Bible says he was without sin. That is to say, Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, is spotless. That's why only the Lord Jesus Christ can be our Savior. Do you think, dear friend, that Jesus just came down here to set us a good example, to tell us some moral stories? Jesus Christ came down here to go to the cross to shed his blood because it's only by the blood of a spotless lamb that you and I can be forgiven of our sins and become the righteousness of God in him. Only through the blood of Jesus and only Jesus' blood will do because only the blood of Christ was the blood of a spotless lamb. Listen, dear friend, every other human being who ever has lived, every other human being who ever will live is sinful. But Jesus Christ was perfect. And so only the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, can make an atonement for our sins. He was sinless. Number two, we said the matzah is unleavened. That means Christ was without sin, but the matzah is striped. That means that Jesus was whipped. Jesus was whipped. If you were to be able to come up here and see, and I had a picture up there earlier that showed the, the matzah, how there's distinctive stripe patterns on it, that's because the Jewish people would use a special fork to run across the bread. And running that fork across the bread, it produced those stripes that you and I can see on the matzah. It's very distinctive, and that's no coincidence. Because the Bible says that our Savior, Jesus Christ, while he was sinless, he was also striped. Did you know that? 700 years before the time of Christ, here's what the Bible prophesied about the Messiah in Isaiah 53. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes. We are healed. John 19, verse 1, did that actually happen to Jesus? Well, let's hear what John had to say. The Bible says, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. You know what it meant for a man to be scourged in the days of Jesus Christ at the hands of the Romans? That means that he would have been taken, he would have been tied to a post, he would have been stripped down naked with all of his backside exposed to two Roman electors who were standing close by ready to scourge the accused. And from the neck all the way down to the feet, the condemned man had many stripes laid on him. In fact, history tells us that Jesus was most presumably 
severely whipped with a whip that was called a cat of nine tails. A cat of nine tails had leather straps that were knotted and were weighted at the end and they were embedded with metal, with nails, and with bone shards. History also even tells us that the whip would sometimes contain a hook at the end and that hook was given a terrible name, scorpion. Scorpion hooks at the end of the whip. The scourging that the condemned would receive would quickly remove the flesh. The flesh would just be hanging off the body like ribbons. It would expose a, expose a bloody mass of muscle and bone. Sometimes it would even expose the internal organs. And this was before the crucifixion. Stripes. Jewish law said that a man could not be beaten more than 39 times consecutive. But the Romans had no such law. And so over and over and over again, excruciating stripes were laid along the backside of our Lord Jesus Christ from the neck all the way down to the feet. Dear church, these matzo stripes that you and I can see remind us of the terrible scourging that Jesus Christ endured for us. He took the stripes that you and I should have received. Seems so far away. We, we treat that so cavalierly when we come to the house of God, when we think about the sacrifice of Christ. But would there anybody today that would be willing to let us set up a scourging post here somewhere on the campus of the church and to be stripped down totally naked and to be tied up and from your head down to your feet be beaten with a whip over and over and over again? Stripes that belong to us were placed on the back of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can we not consider that with brokenness and heaviness of heart? He did nothing wrong. And yet he was severely beaten. Not only that, he was sinless, he was striped. But the matzah is also punctured. You can see from the picture, the matzah is punctured. That means Jesus was pierced. These punctures that you can see running across the bread, visible, they're made by a fork. And they are intended to keep the bread from rising when it is baked. And yet again, we cannot miss the powerful symbolism that there is contained here in this matzah bread. Just as the matzah is punctured, so our Savior Jesus Christ was pierced on our behalf. Do you know the first mention of when Jesus was pierced is in the Bible? About 900 years prior to his birth. Here's what the Bible says in Psalm 22, verse 16, that's all about Jesus. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Believer, that was 900 years before the birth of Christ. Zechariah 12, 10, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, the Bible says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and then they will look on me whom they pierced. Weren't the crowds looking on when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross? Matthew 27, 29, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and they put a reed in his right hand. I wish I had today some thorns from the Judean landscape because they're not like the little rosebush thorns that we've got around here. Oh no, they are sometimes an inch or two inches long. Woven together in a crown of thorns and they shoved it down on the brow of Jesus Christ, penetrating his scalp as the blood flowed into his eyes and down his face. Pierced! John 19, 34. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. 
after Jesus died, after condemned criminals died on the cross, if they suspected they were dead, what they would do is they would take a spear and they would thrust it into the side of the condemned, running into the lung. And if water flowed out, that meant that that person had asphyxiated to death. And so it was with Jesus. John 20, 27, remember after Jesus rose from the dead? He appeared to the disciples and he said this to doubting Thomas. Listen to it. Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. That's the closest that we have in the New Testament to the Bible telling us emphatically, and it is, that Jesus Christ was pierced for us. His scalp, his hands, his feet, his side, Pierce for us. The Romans, when they were nailing, to, nailing him to the cross, when they were piercing his body, they did not even know that their actions were the fulfillment of prophecy that was hundreds of years old. Are you getting the picture that Jesus is God's only Messiah? He is the anointed one of God. He's our Passover lamb. Number four. I want you to see with me that the matzah is broken. The matzah is broken at the Passover Seder, meaning that Jesus was brutalized. We've already talked about His stripes. We've already talked about the ways in which He was punctured and pierced. It's quite clear that the body of Jesus was very badly brutalized. That brutality that was lashed out on Christ is a picture of the matzah. Listen to it one more time. Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. And when he had taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now listen to me. Luke is telling us about the portion of the Passover Seder that happened after the meal. Dessert, if you will. At the beginning of the Passover meal, three pieces of matzah, just like this, were placed in a bag that had three compartments in it. And that bag was called a matzah tosh. The Jews believed that the three pieces of matzah represented either Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or perhaps the three classes of people in Israel, which were priests and Levites and then the regular common people. But as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe that the three pieces of matzah represent the Trinity. God the Son, God the, God, excuse me, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, if that be the case, dear friend, that means the second piece of matzah is representative of God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is that significant? Because the Bible says at the beginning of the Seder meal, the second piece of the matzah was taken from the bag. And though I'm a Gentile, I'm going to try and do this right. It was broken into two pieces. The second one was broken into two pieces. One half was put back in the matzah The other half was rolled up in a white napkin and it was hidden in the house. According to their custom, after the Passover meal, the second piece of matzah that was broken and hidden, a piece about like this, this piece rolled up in a napkin would have been called the afikuman. The afikuman, the, the adults would say to the children, now children, go find the afikuman and bring it back to the table. And whichever one of the children could go find the piece that had been broken and hidden in the house, when they brought it back to the table, that little boy or that little girl would have received a piece of candy or maybe a couple of coins. And that was the price of redemption, to bring the bread back to the table. So listen to me now. When Jesus took up the bread of the Passover, it was after the meal. It was the afikuman. The Bible says here in Luke 22 that he gave thanks and that he began to break it off into olive-sized pieces. According to their tradition, he began to hand it out to all of the men. And the Bible says that all the disciples partook. The breaking of the afikuman that Jesus Christ would have done was representative of the breaking of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in his punishment and in his crucifixion. 
And by the way, the Bible says after he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and they all partook together. The Bible says then that he took up the cup. But it wasn't just any cup that Jesus took up. It was the third cup of the Passover Seder. Remember what I said earlier? The first one is the cup of sanctification. The second is the cup of plagues. The third is the cup of redemption. What did Jesus say about it in Luke 22? He said, this cup, the cup of redemption, is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And so the cup of redemption that Jesus took up represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that makes an atonement for our sins, redeems us, and provides for us the opportunity to become the children of God. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is the blood so important? Because the Bible says, by the way, in Leviticus 17 verse 11, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Only the blood of a spotless lamb applied can fit you and I to live eternally with God in heaven. And that's exactly what Jesus provided. Not some little crackers or wafers or anything else. His own flesh and His own blood. Jesus provided for us. Can I give you one more? I know you've only got a four-point outline there, but can I give you just one more and get happy here for a second? I want some of y'all to get happy here this morning. Amen? Amen. Remember when I said that the second piece of matzah representing our Savior Jesus was broken into two pieces? We just mentioned that. The afikamon, it was taken from the table, it was hidden. Well, there's one more powerful symbol contained in this that you and I cannot miss. Just as the afikamon, was returned to the table at the close of the meal. Jesus Christ is going to return to His people at the end of time. Just when it looks like that all hope has been lost, Jesus Christ is going to come riding in from the heavens on a white horse. He will be armed for battle and the Bible says He will be accompanied with the armies of heaven. And with one word from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says to us plainly that the enemies of God will be destroyed and cast into hell and the those of us who've been patiently awaiting the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ will reign with Him forevermore and throughout all of eternity. We will get to enjoy the bread of life in the presence of God as we give glory and honor and praise to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit throughout all of eternity. Praise be to God. Dear friend, Jesus is the bread of life. Have you partaken of His body and His blood? Jesus told a group of people in John chapter 6, unless you partake of my body, unless you partake of my blood, you have no part in me. And the Bible says in that very same chapter that many people who had previously followed Christ followed Him no longer. They didn't understand that Jesus was using, using the bread and the cup as, as symbols. And what's it symbolic of? What it's symbolic of, dear friend, is that you and I today, if we've heard the gospel, if we've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, we need to turn to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect like you. I've made lots of mistakes. I, I can't earn my way to heaven, but Lord, I believe today that Jesus Christ came to this earth. He died on the cross with His body, with His blood. He paid the penalty for my sins. And Father God, if you'll save me, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ today. Let me become your child. I've got good news for you. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. If you'll place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll become just as much a child of God as any believer in Christ who's ever lived. How about you today, sir or ma'am? Is today the day that you finally let go of the chair at the invitation? And come forward and take a minister of the gospel by the hand? And say, sir, today I'm trusting in Jesus. Would you pray with me? I want to ask God to forgive me and cleanse me of my sin because I believe that He will. 
Maybe for some of you today, it needs to be a prayer of sanctification. Maybe for some of us today, we need to get up here in the altar and just get down before the Lord and say to God, God, thank you so much that, that you died for me, that you sacrificed for me. You took my stripes. You took my piercing. You took my brokenness. And dear church, listen to me when I tell you this. Jesus didn't just suffer physically. The greatest torment that Christ suffered was mental, it was emotional, it was spiritual. Do you know that when all these terrible things were happening to Jesus, where were all the disciples at? They ran away like a bunch of cowards. When Jesus needed his friends most, his friends ran away. Jesus suffered, dear friend, Things that you and I cannot even really begin to imagine. But He did that for you. And He did it for me. And today we are saying to you, whosoever will may come and partake of the bread of life and drink freely of the water of life. You today, sir or ma'am, can receive the grace of God. Or maybe just come up here and give praise to the Lord for Christ's suffering for us.